we're supposed to go at nine, right? Yeah. But I'm gonna go ahead and get started, I guess. I think we'll be fine on time. Um, so I'm Aaron Foster, I'm the I'm the district supervisor for the Wheat Fest district. And um, my goal today is just to give you guys uh, first, I'm assuming there are some concerns uh, by some folks about grasshoppers. We've had some grasshopper problems the last couple of years and what the outlook looks like for this year. So I'm gonna start with that. And then I'll, I'll dive into some of our programs that you may or may not be familiar with, some of our um, programs that can offer services for you guys, and go from there. So thanks for coming. Uh, I'd like to figure this guy out. How do you forward? Okay, so for 2021, um, grasshoppers are going to be a problem for some folks. Um, this is the, the USDA's uh, Western U.S. survey from last year, 2020, the grasshopper survey. Um, the red dots and the orange dots are the problem areas for grasshoppers, the real significant areas. And as you can see, Montana and the Pacific Northwest, they're going to probably have some significant this next year. For Wyoming, it looks like we're going to have some problems too. A lot of the major problems are going to be focused on that northeastern part of the state, but it looks like uh, there could be some problems in our neighboring counties to the north, Washington County and Hot Springs County. The red dots again are where they saw some problem areas last year within their surveys. Um, going a little bit closer to home, Fremont County, we've had problem grasshoppers last three years. Um, last year it seemed like we were starting to see a little bit of a decline and the USDA's surveys are kind of showing that as well. It looks like in Fremont County maybe except for our northern border and a little bit of some question areas kind of west of Fort Washakie, hopefully our grasshopper problems are in decline. And this could be just natural progression, you know they're cycling, we've had our problems, maybe we're going to start to see ourselves get away from that. But also, we've done quite a bit of work with grasshoppers the last couple of years. The district has offered cost share for landowners working with grasshopper problems. Um, and then we've also helped coordinate two pretty significant aerial treatment programs. 2019, we did one west of Lander. It's about 15,000 acres. And then last year, we did about 40,000 acres down, down here, which was hot in 2019 uh, by the Twin Creek area. And so those in combination to natural issues may be helping us kind of see our way out of this. So my fingers are crossed that our grasshoppers aren't going to be as bad. However, we still offer services for them. Um, in Fremont County, the, we have a lot of different grasshopper species, but there's four species that have really caused the problems, at least in the last couple of years. And that's the four there. Most of these grasshoppers, they, they hatch around mid-May, and they continue to hatch up through June. Um, grasshoppers go, develop through a series of instars um, where they, they, they look like just miniature grasshoppers and they just get bigger and bigger and bigger. They have about four to five of those that last, each one lasts about seven to ten days and then they turn into flying adults. Once you have flying adults, your, your chances of good control go way down. So it's really important to catch them while they're young. Um, as far as products that Wheaton Fest offers, you might want to know um, trying to get these young grasshoppers. We have a, a bait that has carbaryl embedded in it, which is a good product for, for smaller acreages. It has about two weeks of residual, so you spread it out and it, you know, it'll last for a while. Um, it's pretty safe. The great thing about the bait products are that they don't impact bees at all, and they're pretty safe on a lot of non-organ insects. So it gives you a little more selectivity on the grasshoppers. It can be kind of pricey, but it's a good product. Um, if you have a small, piece of land, your, most of your problems are like ornamentals and turf situation. We sell a product called Tempo, which is really good for quick knockdown. People seem to be pretty happy with it. It's a good product. Um, if you're stepping up a little bit in acreage, that could be a little bit expensive, and so you might be thinking about a cost-effective alternative. We have Carbaryl, which is the same product that the bait has on it, but it's in liquid form. It is pretty nasty on bees. If you have flowering plants or weeds, uh, avoid them because you can definitely kill bees on that. We don't want you to do that, um, but it's pretty cost effective and it does good knockdown. It doesn't have much residual, but a good knockdown. 
Um, stepping up even further, um, one of the best products available is called Dimalin. Um, it's a very selective product. It's an insect growth regulator, so you have to spray the area and target the small one that has no impact on adult grasshoppers. But it's really uh, has high efficacy. It's really safe for bees and for the environment. Um, it has about a 30 day residual, it's a good product. Um, I'd recommend that for folks with larger acreages, especially if you've got crops and you're trying to protect the crops, um, it, it might be a good choice. The baggage of Dimalin is it's a restricted use product, so you have to have that private tested out to license to buy it. But don't let that just be dece uh, deceiving. It is probably one of the safer products available. On that uh, bait one that you mentioned first, is that something you need to spread across your field or is this something that you can literally put out in the line like you would in or whatever? You you wouldn't have to do the entire field. Okay. You could do you could do some protective areas around okay. your fields, you could do hot spots where you where you've seen a patch, things like that. All right, so it doesn't need to be like fertilizer where you spread that across the field. It, it doesn't, yeah. Okay. It should provide, it provides some of that control when you move into where you spread it. All right. Um, the keys to success in grasshopper management is to get them while they're small, you know, get them early. So we definitely recommend that you monitor your property early in the season, start about May 15th, walk around your, your field borders, your field, um, the rangeland next to your fields, any weedy areas in your property, you know, keep an eye out for any potential hatches that may be happening on your property. Um, if you see those hatches, that's a great time to get them. A lot of times they, they conjugate all the thousands of grasshoppers together, little tiny things about the size of rice. You can then just grab your carb grill or your tempo or your bait, go put it in that little hatch, and you, you've solved that particular hatch. Um, you should probably continue doing those surveys on a regular basis on your property to catch those hatches uh, through June, I'd recommend. Um, if you do find those large infestations, um, as young grasshoppers, like I said, they're easy to treat, spot treat them. Um, it won't save you from your neighbors, but it'll help protect your own situation. Um, as I mentioned, the Dimlin product, that's a, that's a good product if you also want to consider a preventative program. And if you had problems last year with grasshoppers, there's a good chance you'll have them again this year. So one thing you could do if you don't have enough time to keep up with the monitoring is you can just plan on a preventative treatment using the dim one. And once you get your applicator license, you can buy it. You can split it on just by any sprayer you have. We also have one to prevent. But you can just spray, sorry, May 15th, spray your field borders, your field edges, and weedy areas with dim one. Um, and that can help catch those hatches that you may not see the grasshoppers coming in. It's a, good, it's a good way to think about just providing a little bit of insurance for your crops. It's pretty inexpensive. Um, I would do at least that May 15th treatment, 30 days later, I'd do it again, and then you might think about doing one more in July just to make sure. It's a fairly inexpensive uh, preventative for me. So, catch them early. That's the key to that. Um, the district does offer some services. We can help you with your monitoring. Um, we do our own monitoring along with the USDA to uh, try to identify problem areas. We help landowners that uh, think they have problems. We can help identify grasshoppers you might be having on your property and if they will actually attack your crops um, and then we can also help give you some guidance on what products might be available to help you manage them. Um, we do offer some equipment rentals. We have liquid sprayers like the one on the left, put on the left, and then we have the bait spreader. So if you're using the bait, it's, uh, it's kind of hard to spread. So we do have a couple of these spreaders that you can rent from us, put on the back of your side by side of your pickup and run around your property and help get it spread around a nice and fashion. You know, it can get pretty pricey if you use too much for a small area. So we do have that. Um, and then we also offer cost share on insecticides through our offices. We also offer some cost share through the ag dealers, both Bighorn Co-op and Rock Mountain Agronomy have agreements with us to offer cost share so you can get the products there. Um, and then our website, we have pretty good reference material if you want to do some research on grasshoppers. We have some information on there as well. So resource available. Okay, uh, I guess while well, we switch gears, you guys have any questions on grasshoppers while we, before we switch gears on different programs? Okay, so the next set of slides are really just kind of programs that you may or may not be familiar with, but something you uh, have available to you. Um, our Russian Olive Control Program, we do offer during the winter months, we offer a labor and a herbicide cost share for Russian Olive Control. Um, this is definitely dependent. We only have
have we have a smaller staff in the winter. Uh, we don't have a lot of equipment to do it, but we do have some equipment. So we could definitely have a consultation with you and potentially help you out with some labor and some of the chemical treatments of Russian olive. Um, we also offer the herbicide for Russian olive control year round if you want to do it yourself. Uh, so why is Russian olive bad? Well, it competes with our desirable woody riparian vegetation, such as cottonwoods and willows, to crowd them out. Um, it reduces that riparian diversity. You start pushing those guys out, and all of a sudden, all you have is Russian olive instead of cottonwoods, willows, uh, silver, silver, silver buffleberry, things like that. Um, when they get really thick, they consume more water than would normally be consumed by the natural vegetation. Um, they can change the stream, the stream channel flows and either concentrate it or change the flooding potential in that area. So it can change the dynamics of your water flows. And then, if you're familiar with Russian lots, you know how thick they can get and how hard it is to get through those thickets. Uh, that's not just us, but it's also livestock and wildlife that have a hard time getting through that, getting through that water source and things like that. So that's why Russian olive is considered a problem. Uh, so best practices for Russian olive management. Number one is Russian olive, and this goes really for any noxious weed, but in particular with Russian <coughs> olive, is you can't just cut them down and say you're done. Um, if you have Russian olive problems before you invest energy into it, think about it in a long-term scheme. And I would say at least three to five years, right? Have a long-term plan on this, because you're going to get restructs. Um, year one, that's going to be your most expensive year and your most um, labor-intensive year as well. That's when, if you have large plants, you're going to have to go in there and cut them down, you have to treat the stumps, um, and then invest in the herb century. That's where, the, that's where it's done. Uh, for larger trees, greater than six inches in diameter, you probably have to use a chainsaw or other piece of equipment to cut them off as low as the ground as you can, and then treat those stumps immediately after. Um, for smaller trees that are less than six inches in diameter, but taller than let's say six feet tall, five, six feet tall, you can do what's called a basal bar treatment, that picture at the bottom there, where you, you treat with an herbicide um, the entire circumference of the, all the trunks from the soil surface to about eight inches up, um, and then you don't mess with them, you let them die, and then you go in there and you cut them down the next year or so. So that works pretty good for small trees, more efficient. If you have small trees, you can treat them foliarly, just like any other noxious weed. Um, with foliar treatments though, you want to try to do those during the growing season. With the other treatments, you can actually do those in the winter, right now would be fun. Um, with the cut stump treatments, you don't want to wait too long to treat them. Um, they wait too long, they pull down their water, and they don't take the herbicide in. So ideally, you cut it down and treat that stump right away. And you treat, you treat around the stump edge and then down the trunks to the soil surface the best crop. Um, going forward, hopefully you get some good control with that treatment the first year going forward and years two and beyond. Things should be easier. You throw on a backpack in the, in the summer and you walk where your brush lawns were and you treat you need to regrow around those stumps and then new sprouts. And that's all you really have to do. Uh, for the Russian office. But starting in year, year two and beyond, what you might also see is a, um, a release of other noxious weeds. So you take out the competition, you take out the shade, you open up the site because the disturbances make it available for new weeds like Russian olive and cannabis. So that's when you gotta start keeping an eye on that, and you may have to treat for those two to keep them out. Um, beyond that, the other thing to think about is maybe some long term restoration. So you, once you pull those guys out, then what do you do? Well, you might want to get more grass in there to try to increase your grazing capacity. But you might want to plant some cottonwoods or, or some, some willows back in the site to, to kind of get it back to a more normal condition. So think long term. Okay, so um, the district also has what we call a special management program. It's actually a, a separate component to our Weed and Pest Act. Um, it allows us to offer some additional cost shares for up to two species. Fremont County, the two species that we have on our special management program are Russian knapweed and leafy spurge. Um, in, order to be, in order to participate in this, you have to be an enrolled landowner. That's just part of the requirements on our statutes. Um, once you're enrolled and, you, and we verify that you do have one of these two problems on your property, then it qualifies you for an 80% cost share for both labor and herbicide. Um, last year we did about just under $200,000 with special management work on these two species. That's a fun fact. Uh, some of the success with our special management program, 
This is Russian, yeah, Russian Napoli. Picture on the left by Riverton here. Um, kind of just by the casino, actually. Uh, in 2016, that field was just dominated by Russian Napoli. You can see all the green stems in that picture on the left there. Um, we treated that fall, and then follow-up monitoring over the years to 2019. We're maintaining pretty good control. All the, this is all good stuff. This is all straw-colored, desirable grass. So that's a good thing. Um, Russian nap, we fairly easy control, fairly good results uh, for multiple years. We did it, we did go in there and, and keep up with it. it. It wasn't like it wasn't 16, but there's a few plants that show up here and there you get. So the investment and in energy and, and herbicide goes way down once you get that initial problem under control. Uh, another site, this is last last year, well 2019 really. This is a project that we did over in LifeSite with a uh, helicopter on several thousand acres of land throughout there. It's kind of hard to see in the photo, but in the photo on the left, the dark green is Russian knapweed. It was the dominant in there. And then we treated it in the fall. One year after, we had a nice release of uh, perennial desirable grass at that site. So Russian knapweed is pretty good, pretty, has some favorable control. The data on this site also backs up the photos. Um, in 19, the bar at the right here, the blue, is the Russian knapweed density for cover, excuse me. And the year following, it's basically gone. Um, and we also saw, even though last year was a drought year, we didn't get good moisture in the spring, we still saw an increase in that production, uh, productive grass. So that's a good thing. With Russian knapweed, you know, we get, it, it's easier to control. Our season to spray goes into the late fall, which is nice and helpful for us. Um, and we see multiple years of control. So we like that. Now, leafy spurge, leafy spurge is a little different animal. Um, if you're, if you're in the lander country, you're probably very familiar with leafy spurge. Uh, outside of that, maybe, maybe not. Uh, leafy spurge is an extremely tough plant to kill. We don't have a lot of products available that are actually effective on it um, for the long term. But you can have some success as long as you keep up with it. So this, pro this project over in the lander area, uh, four year project that started in 17, we had dense leafy spurge, that's the yellow flower in that picture on the left. Um, and last year, in the spring, we saw we saw no leaf spurge. Now, it's a little deceiving um, when you look at the years in between. With leafy spurge, what we see with most of our treatments, unless you're using an herbicide that uh, at rates that start killing are desirable, but we don't want to do, what we typically see is we see ups and downs. We see good control for one year, and then the spurge is right back in there. And we did see that with this project. The chart shows uh, the blue on the right is leafy spurge. 17, we got control, came right back in 19, and then last year, you know, I couldn't find any. That was good. But next year, it'll probably start to come back in. Um, so when you have a leaf spurge problem, it's one of those things you just gotta keep on it. You probably have to keep on it for years. It has a really, really uh, extensive root system, so it can slowly regenerate from that root system um, after treatments. Uh, but you can have some success. This site doesn't have really great grass production anyway, but we did see some grass increase. Um, but if you have spurge problems in, a, in an irrigated situation and you treat annually, you can actually keep the spurge under control and increase your productive grass in there. Uh, just another photo, just some other photos from our, our government trial the spurge project. This is a four year project. Uh, it was a collaborative project between federal, state, and BLM. Land ownerships. This is an aerial image of uh, both of our. At the beginning of the project, on the picture on the left, you can see the yellow in that drainage. That's all leafy spurge. And then one year after, we didn't see, same time of year, didn't see any yellow spurge. Just kind of illustrates the expanse of the problem. This project area actually is about 200,000 acres, and we treat about 3,000 acres of spurge every year out there with the helicopter. It's been pretty successful, but we can't walk away from it. Um, Incidentally, this project also was uh, incorporating cheatgrass control. I don't know how many of you guys are familiar with cheatgrass, probably everybody in here. Um, we are seeing some pretty good success with cheatgrass control on this particular treatment site. Um, in the picture on the left, the red in that draw is cheatgrass. And then in 2018, we didn't have hardly any cheatgrass. You can't see the red after it dried down in that site. So that's kind of exciting on a side note. And just to kind of further discuss the project. This is all the project monitoring sites lumped together. You see that same pattern with Spurge where we have the up and down, up and down control. Um, 
we see an increase in grass, except for last year in these sites, I think that's likely contributed to, we had basically zero spring rain, and so our grasses didn't have any growth. Uh, but what I find quite interesting is, is this cheatgrass just a steady decline in cheatgrass cover over the life of the project, so that's exciting for us. On a side note, from a special management point. So uh, anybody in the county who owns land can get involved in the special management program as long as you're dealing with the two crop species we have. So all you really need to do is you can fill out a form, um, tell us you're interested. What we will have to do eventually is we'll get on your site and confirm you have it. Uh, once you're enrolled, um, the site goes on a calendar basis. So if you talk to us this year, show your interest, we're going to take a look. We'll get you enrolled for next year so you qualify for the full cost year next year. Uh, but anyway, it's eligible. Um, you can get our forms from our offices or our website. Um, and then we'll schedule a time to talk with you. Uh, we also offer a comparable program to match the 80% cost share of Russian athlete for BIA lease land through our BIA program. So, you know, if you're in that kind of threshold where you've got all three situations going on, um, BIA, uh, tribal land, and private land, there's a way to kind of put it all together. So uh, keep that in mind. Good, option, good, good program to help you know landowners get ahead of some of our bigger problems. Uh, another program that we offer that hopefully you guys are familiar with, if you're interested, we offer uh, weed-free forage and gravel inspection certification. Um, this program certifies to the North American weed-free forage standards, which is what is required to take hay and straw to federal land and up over to Teton County. We require that, so we certify that. It's a certification for 55 different invasive plants. And then Fremont County also has three declared species that are on that list that we certify for. Swain some pea, baby's breath, and cheatgrass as well. Um, our inspectors, they look at not only your field, but they're gonna look at your field borders and where you store your hay too. If you have a hay that's stored in an area that's full of Russian nappy like this photo, they probably won't pass. Do something about that Russian athlete first. Um, so, if you're a grower, why consider getting your hay certified? Well, it does increase your marketability and allows you to sell it to those restricted areas. If you're a consumer of hay, why should you consider buying certified hay? Well, it's kind of an insurance policy. You know, you, you can feel better about buying that product and reducing the risk of actually introducing something you may not have to your property, which will spread and eventually cost you maintenance money over the treatment of that in the future. So. I look at that one. Um, for both the producer and the consumer, you know, it's a way to help reduce the spread of invasive species. So, some things to think about. And I mentioned this throughout that we offer consultation services. If you ever have questions on your weeds or pests on your property, um, somebody from the weed pest is more than happy to come out and talk to you, um, see what your problems are hopefully help you come up with a management plan that is effective, meets your, meets your, and meets your goals, and meets your budget. So we're always available for that. 332-1052, um, it's a good way to start, and we'll get you somebody out there. Um, another program that some people may or may not be familiar with is our, our biological control program. Um, Fremont County has actually been, Fremont County Weed Pass has actually been involved in the research and development of biological agents for decades, actually probably one of the first counties to really get involved with it. Um, biological control is using natural enemies to combat these weeds and pests. It adds another stressor to them, so it helps your IPM program, where you might use herbicides or digging or cutting, also include the biological controls. Um, most of the time they're insects, not always, but 90% of the time they're insects. These insects are natural enemies of our, of our pest plants where they come from. And there's about 10 to 15 years of research and a lot of money that goes into ensuring that these bugs aren't or won't become pests themselves once we introduce them into America. And there's pretty little risk of that happening. They're very, very host specific. They only like to eat the target plants. And in a lot of these cases, they actually do provide a level of management. You'll never see biological control be introduced and five years later that infestation of weeds just gone but you might see a increase in more desirable vegetation along with the weeds. We've seen that with our leafy spurge for sure, where we've seen the spurge doesn't go away,
but over the 25 years of when the bugs were out there, the perennial forage increased as well. So you know, it's kind of a balance again. We do have that program. Happy to come out and see if you already have them on your property or if you have the weeds to have biofuels available, and we can help you get some on your property. <clears throat> One of our most important programs, at least in my opinion, is our high priority uh, weed control program. This program, um, the district, and this guy here is in charge of it actually, Bob. Uh, this program uh, targets all of our high priority and isolated weed infestations in the county. We monitor those every year and we treat them if we need to. We treat new ones that are found or reported. And what this does is it catches these small isolated rare plants or rare infestations in an otherwise clean area and prevents them from becoming the next, next widespread Russian knapweed, leafy spurge, cheatgrass problems that are everywhere. So it's a really important program for um, keeping these new invaders from becoming the next widespread invader. Um, the other key component of this program that is important, and that's why I'm here today, is to educate you all on some of the weeds that are not that common, but are really important to catch. And so the next few slides are going to be some pictures and some information about some weeds that we want you to help us identify and report to see them. So spotted napweed, this guy is probably the most significant weed over in Teton County. Um, it's also one of the most significant weeds in western Montana, causing all kinds of problems over there. We don't have that much in Fremont County. Um, so it's definitely one of our high priority plants. This is a perennial, so it comes back with fruit every year. Um, it also spreads by seed. Um, it looks a lot like Canada's thistle, except for it doesn't have the spine, so it's looking. Um, one of the keys to identifying this plant is when it's flowering, you can see where it gets its name. You can see the little spots on the seed head, when it's spotted naphthalene. That's a good way to look for it. Uh, if you see anything that looks like this at all, let us know. This is definitely one we want to get on our program and try to uh, Dalmatian toad flaps. This guy is an escape door metal. This came over in the 1800s with the celibate. Um, it's believed that people brought it over and planted it here because of its desirable yellow snapdragon like flowers. Um, but ever since then, it's found a niche in our rangelands and definitely competes with our rangeland forage. Uh, Dalmatian toad flax. Um, right now is concentrated to mostly around Lander, but we do have some sizable problems over there. And that's where we want to keep it. Um, it is moving downwind, and that's where Bob targets those every year. Uh, as you can see in those pictures, those are right around Lander. It can be kind of a nasty thing all the way up. This guy, um, if you have a proper mix, isn't too hard to control, but it does really require a good adjuvant. So an addition to your herbicide tank to help the herbicide spread on the really waxed leaves and stick to them. Otherwise, it just beads up and rolls off and you're not going to get the control you think you should be in. So it's tough to kill that way. Let us know if you see that guy. So baby's breath, right? Uh, everybody knows about baby's breath. It's one of those um, decorative foliage additions to most flower arrangements. Um, unfortunately, baby's breath in Fremont County um, was planted originally, this is what I understand the story, it was planted originally as an agricultural product. They were going to try, the landowner was going to try to grow it, sell it as an agricultural product. That didn't work out, but it did spread from that agricultural production area out of Ocean Lake, and now it's a big problem for a lot of landowners right around Ocean Lake. And of course, it also moves off where we find it moving is away from the cemeteries. So, Baby's Breath, it's a perennial, it comes back every year from its root. But its spread mechanism is a tumbleweed. It's a very effective tumbleweed, a big one at that. So when it dries down in the fall, breaks off the soil surface, starts blowing in the wind, dropping its seed everywhere it goes. And then it also piles up against your fences and your, your shelter belts and your buildings, creating problems there, but also increasing your fire hazard in those situations. So baby breath's kind of nasty guy, and you can see in that field there, this near Ocean Lake, uh, all the white is baby breath. It's a big plant. So it's competing for resources, and it's also shading out for desirable grasses. So it's, it's a problem, maybe a lesser known problem, but I think it's a pretty significant problem, especially out there. Um, Scotch thistle, 
Most pistols, uh, well, not most pistols, but we have a lot of pistols that are kind of weak. Canada pistol being the primary one. Kind of but this guy is a biannual pistol. So instead of recurring multiple years, it grows as a big rosette on the ground year one, and then the next year instead of a big flower stalk, and that's it. This guy's a giant. Uh, its leaves are huge. It grows to be six to eight feet tall, no problem. Big plant. Um, pretty easy to control, though. Pretty easy to kill. It it's, uh, reacts to herbicides very well, and also it doesn't like shovel very much either. So if you have a couple plants, pretty easy to get rid of. Um, did it priority for us. Um, incidentally, or as a side note on this guy, it was planted in Scotland. Planted. It was used in Scotland as a uh, deterrent to intruders coming into establishments. So they would establish scotch thistle on the perimeters of their areas. And it, you know, it's such a big, robust plant with big thorns and nasty uh, spikes on it that uh, intruders didn't want to go through it. So it was a good deterrent keeping people from walking in on your property and attacking you. So it does have that value, I suppose. Um, so look for that one. If you see a funny looking thistle on the ground and tall, it's really big, it seems bigger than it should be, and it has a kind of a bluish green tint to it, it could be the sky system. And if you get curious, call us. Uh, we'll take a look at it, confirm it, and get you on the list for high priority care. But you say that goes away after the second year? Yeah, it will come up new seeds, yeah. It new won't go away, but that one plant will be dead. How does cultivation affect that? Uh, I got a ton of this stuff, I didn't realize that. Do you have scotch system? Oh yeah. <laughs> oh well, you should get what's good <laughs> thought here. Yeah, it's on some new seeding we got on some virgin ground that we killed up. Oh, really? It was boring. Okay. If you're plowing it up, you're probably going to kill it. You're probably not going to get rid of the seeds. So then, then the key would be, um, are you creating something that's going to compete against it from your tillage? And if you put in something like irrigated oh, yeah. hay, you're probably not going to have too many problems in there, but you might have problems on the borders. Last, the last year was bad because of the water situation. Yeah. Last year we had the fall plant. So the year before we had the rosettes, and so it's on about a 40 acre spot under a pivot. Oh yeah. And but with the water situation last year, the rosettes were. I mean, man, they were six, seven feet tall. Yeah. All sure. over in that marble, it was horrible. Mm -hmm. So this year it'll be tilled up and put into alfalfa. Okay. Irrigated alfalfa again, but. Yeah, you probably you shouldn't have too many issues in that alfalfa once it gets established. But you probably you may have a seed bank in, in and around your property that could be worth looking into. More than likely. You should, you should give them one of your cards. Yeah. Yeah. We'll take a look. Okay. Um, another troublesome invader, uh, particularly troublesome due to its, its spread ability, is Hellenstone. Um, this is a biennial plant, too, so it looks like a little rosette first year, this guy here, and then it grows up into that second year. Uh, but when it dries down from this, it has these, these dry stems, and on those stems are these seeds, all these seeds that are. They have uh, recurved hooks like Velcro, and they snag anything that walks through it. And that's how it spreads everywhere. And we find this plant a lot of times under tree shrubs where wildlife kind of bed down and they drop the seeds. So we see that, we see it boom, 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 all over the place. Um, pretty nasty plant, tough one to get control of because of its ability to spread so effectively. Um, it is toxic to horses, but they would really have to be starved for one. How's about nasty guy? Um, problem here. Not much of a problem. Oxide daisy uh, is another one of those escaped ornamentals. As you can probably tell, it's a pretty flower. You know, um, if you want something that looks like that, we would recommend maybe considering Shasta daisy instead of taking this from the field and planting in the yard. Uh, Shasta daisy is a derivative of this guy, but doesn't seem to be spreading from its plantings like this. The oxide daisy uh, still fight people because they don't want to kill it, of course, because it's a pretty flower, but it is, it is pretty damaging. And our most significant problem here is the entire Wiggins Fork drainage. If you're familiar with the Wiggins Fork, it's a pretty remote, it's a pretty remote river system up by Dubois in the Absorcas. It starts in the wilderness. We think it got started from infect, uh, infested hay that was introduced up there decades ago. And then it has, has since spread down the mountain into the watershed kind of starts to thin out, and we want to hold it there. We don't want to see it get into the East Fork and down the main Wind River and spread, and 
and can cause problems in production for grass hay fields, where I've seen it be a problem before in those kind of situations, and it really, it's like anything, it doesn't help you when it's competing for those resources to make your forage quality go down. So oxide easy, um, it's pretty easy to identify. Um, you may not want to kill it, but we encourage you to report it to us. So, any suspicious plants, you know, we're always here to help. We'd love to come take a look if you have questions, especially if you see something suspicious that we just identified. Uh, but anything that seems out of place, you know, you can come take a look, you can take a picture, email it to us. Um, you can uh, bring a specimen into one of our shops and try to identify it for you. Um, it's really important that we try to stop new infestations from happening. We already have our problem weeds. Um, in my, in my view, and I think the board's view, is if we can keep Fremont County from having new infestations so significant, significantly impact our land like some of our other widespread plants, then we're, we're succeeding. So there's our number, there's our general email address, you can send photos to or questions about it. So report anything, we'd appreciate it. Um, we're doing okay. Last slide here, just a kind of a summary of some of our other projects. At our booth, uh, we have a, a services brochure Feel free to grab one of those, kind of goes into you know, some details about what we offer. We have 40% uh, cost share on herbicides and pesticides for noxious weeds and pests at our, at our offices. We also offer cost share for noxious weeds and pests through our ag dealers, like I mentioned earlier. Um, we do all the noxious weed control for the county roads as best as we can with our budget limitations. Um, we also encourage cooperative projects, and cooperative projects we can often offer more cost share in the form of labor cost share. Examples of these would be irrigation districts like Midvale or um, some of the irrigation districts on the reservation or even ditch companies that may have a collaborative uh, water right on the system. We do have outreach and education programs like these. We try to share our information as much as, much as possible, get out there and inform people of problems, what they should look for in services. We can also help with, uh, if you're a business or private person that is looking for information, we can help you with uh, some training on how to be a certified applicator, like Bob Finley's going to help teach tomorrow. Um, we also offer weed ID training. Um, so, you know, example, if you had folks working for you and you're out in, the, out in the range, we'd be happy to come do weed ID training and help them learn so their eyes and feel can help identify some of these problems. Uh, we don't spray for mosquitoes, however, we do uh, offer cost shares for insecticides for mosquitoes, and we help administer a grant program that goes to all the cities and tribes. And we also are the source for the West Nile virus detection program. So all those abatement districts send uh, West Nile virus detection mosquitoes to us, and we run them through our ramp testing program and identify whether we have West Nile virus in that particular pool and report that to those agencies for, you know, control. And then, of course, one of the things we're really trying to do is encourage folks to understand your spray systems, understand what you're spraying. Um, so we offer um, on-site, you can bring it to us. Uh, we also have some videos available for sprayer calibration. It's really important because not only does it help you save money on underspraying herbicides and insecticides, but it can also help you reduce chances of causing more to our danger. So a lot of times you might see detrimental impacts. It may not be the herbicide, it may be because you mix too much and you didn't understand. So consider so, those options, and uh, if you guys have any questions, that's really all I had. Cool. Um, at our booth, we will have, if you had any of this perks of interest, we have a quick brochure on, on Russian olive and woody control. Um, some specific information about Russian olive, too, a little more detail. Um, we do have our services brochure, and then you do have this about the grasshopper. Grasshopper control products. Okay, well our website will have it. It's some specific details on some of the products that we sell for grasshopper control. And it gives you some information about them. And, uh, it's all the reference. And then if you're interested in this, we got our desk too. Just kind of highlighting it. This is our 2020 year end report. If you're curious more about what Weed Invest does and what we try to accomplish, there's some good information in there. Um, I don't have a lot of them, but this is the desk copy if you want to thumb through it. With that, thanks.